Dr. Susan, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to this last session, and uh, we'll go through my slides really quickly. This is our final webinar. If you're aiming for Credly badge, you need to listen to all the webinars, either live or the recordings, and complete all the assignments. And you need to get everything turned in by August 16th, and then I will issue the badges for everyone that finished um, the following week. So you can start badgering me um, if you think you deserved a badge and didn't get one in, you know, towards the end of August. But I, I think we're fine. So um, if you have questions about connecting to collections care, join, uh, join the connecting to collections care community. So if you have questions about caring for your collections, um, you can find the instructions on our website. And we have conservators there who monitor it, uh, and so you'll get answers quickly. And if you need disaster assistance and you're in the US, you can use the National Heritage Responders 24-hour hotline. Coming up, uh, towards in a couple of weeks, we have a webinar on fire. And then at the beginning of September, we have a webinar on uh, archival processing. And these are both free. And now I'm going to turn this over to Samantha. Um, remember, if you have any questions, if you type them in the general chat box, I'll collect them to answer later. OK, Samantha. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everybody. It's good to see you all here today. And congratulations, we've made it to the end. Um, this is our final webinar today. We're going to be um, talking about making that leap into writing a preservation plan after you've gotten your assessment. We talked last week about how useful these assessments can be for grant writing and fundraising purposes, but um, this one's a little bit more internally focused. How do you use this? Um, inside your institution. And after you receive your assessment, there's, you know, tons of recommendations that, um, you know, need to be dealt with, either implemented or, or you know, ignored in some cases. Um, and a preservation plan is an essential institutional document that helps collecting institutions thoughtfully and carefully chart a course for the preservation of their collections for three to five years. Assessments help to lay the groundwork to creating such a document, and, and that's why they're so important and why we're sort of talking about these things together. Um, in this webinar, I'm hoping to sort of provide guidance on how to create a preservation plan um, and then show you how to sort of um, recommendations from assessments can be made into implementable uh, goals, objectives, and strategies in these plans. Um, so I will go ahead and jump in. I did want to mention real quick, I, I enjoyed reading everybody's um, self-assessments. And you should have had your um, your comments come back to you. So just make sure that uh, if you have any questions about that, let, let me know. I see Sharon is um, talking a little bit about some of the comments that uh, she she got on her um, on her assessment. Uh, Sharon was in a class with me earlier this year, and we played this game called Mono policy, in which we really saw the importance of policy development. Um, it was a game created by John Simmons. So if you want to look that up to kind of uh, drive home the importance of policy development, um, that's a good one to, to check out. Um, great. So let's go ahead and jump into the content. Um, before we get too far along here, I want to make sure we discuss the differences in approaches to preservation. And there's two basic approaches here. It's preventative and remedial. Preventative preservation plays much the same role with respect to artifacts as do you know, public health and preventive medicine does for people. It's more of a long-term view. You, know, you want to eat right and exercise. That keeps you healthy. Um, just like making sure your collections are in appropriate storage environments keeps them healthy. Um, for the most part, many preventive preservation methods can be easily folded into things that the institution does normally, acquisitions, rehousing, processing, shelving, cleaning, photocopying, deaccessioning, et cetera. Um, as each of these tasks are done, they affect the long-term survival of the collection. So performing them with you know, archival housing materials, 
uh, with safe handling practices, et cetera, you can really sort of extend the lifespan of your objects. And preventative preservation really refers to a range of direct and indirect actions undertaken on collections aimed at preventing degradation and prolonging document lifespans, carrying out environmental checks, preparing and monitoring an emergency plan, transferring to alternate media, and the like. Um, so if that's preventative preservation, like seeing your general practitioner for regular checkups, right? Um, then remedial preservation is like going to visit an ER doctor after breaking a bone. So the ER doctor will reset your bone, will bandage you up, um, but they're not going to look at sort of the longer-term issues you might be having, like, you know, your cholesterol levels or something like that. There's more like an individual item-level conservation treatment you might want to have done on some of your institution's most treasured objects. And definitely still part of preservation planning. You need to budget time and funds to have that conservation work done. However, as you can sort of see, I think, between these um, two conversations here, preventive measures have the greatest impact on the long-term preservation of the collection as a whole. So to the extent practical, preservation planning should really focus first on the activities that will benefit the collection as a whole by preventing or minimizing damage or loss of those preventative things. Um, and then look at uh, the remedial treatment needs of the specific parts of the collections or individual items. For example, it doesn't make a whole lot of time, like a lot of sense to invest resources on conservation treatment only to, you know, return items to a poor storage environment where they're going to just get damaged again by uh, temperature and humidity fluctuations or to allow careless handling to continue and items get dropped. You're just going to have to do it again. Um, so these two things are, are, it's important to understand the difference between both when we're talking about preservation planning. So I just wanted to, to make sure that that is understood from the beginning here. Um, so now let's talk about what preservation planning is. As cultural institutions, libraries, archives, museums, historic sites, and the like are all responsible not only for collecting, interpreting, and exhibiting significant materials that document history and art and all of those things, but also for the long-term preservation, security, and accessibility of those materials. So in other words, we are responsible for the stewardship of our materials. And there's a lot that goes into that, right? Collections management and preservation must be considered in all institutional decisions, from building maintenance to security to staffing. And only when the infrastructure of collections care and management is in place and is consistently um, and constantly supported, can an institution safely design and install exhibitions, plan pro public programming, and provide research access. Um, all of these preventative measures must be taken in place to ensure that collection safety and well-being. And I mentioned this in a lot of comments to people um, in their, their um, self-assessments is it doesn't sound like you have a, there's a lot of communication happening interdepartmentally. And, you know, that's really important in preservation planning is it has to be something that is understood on an institutional level, not just your department. Um, and so, you know, I know that's a lot easier said than done, right? But uh, it's, it's something we definitely want to strive for. Um, and that's because the public really entrusts us with the task of properly caring for collections materials. Um, in fact, usually preservation is an integral part of our mission, um, so we really do have an ethical obligation to take care of things to the best of our abilities, and that can be a really good kind of argument for why the rest of the institution needs to, to get on board with this. So I'd recommend that approach when you're trying to get others on board. Um, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a big planner in general, and as most things in life, the best way to take care of things is to have a plan. So in the case of collections care, the the best way to make that happen is through preservation planning, which should be part of the institution's overall strategic plan, um, as well as your sort of departmental plan. So um, probably, since you guys are, are all here in this series and you've made it to the end, you all understand why preservation planning is so important. But again, I, I really want to give you guys some ammo to go back to your upper management your administrators, boards, um, all those people, and explain to them why this is so important to kind of get everybody on board. Um, when an institution undertakes preservation planning with a clear understanding of the purpose, scope, and nature of its collection, preservation plans can be developed that are responsive to institutional priorities, users' needs, and the preservation of the collection. 
It can also be, and this is really important here, it can also be um, a really big money saver. It's more cost effective for the institution. Putting in smaller sums of money over the long haul is usually preferable to paying a large chunk of money to fix a giant problem once it becomes a disaster. So, um, you know, that's, that's something that can really help. And it's the best use of your money. Remember that uh, example I just gave you uh, with the remedial versus preventative, it doesn't make sense to sort of spend all that money on that conservation just to have it go bad again, right? Um, so it's a really good use of funds as well. Um, also key to effective preservation planning is the establishment of intellectual control over existing holdings. Um, Lee talked about this a little bit about um, in his his uh, webinar last week or the week before, excuse me, about sort of the the order in which things have to be done and the inventory comes first, right? Getting that intellectual control over everything. Um, the staff knowledge of the nature, scope, and quantity of the collections guides many of the decisions involved in preservation planning, um, including selecting and prioritizing materials for preservation, uh, determining needs for resources such as staffing, funding, and supplies, um, and even what sorts of assessments you're going to be doing, right? Um, staff familiarity with the content of the collection also provides information about their value for research as well as their historical, artifactual, or aesthetic value. The staff's understanding of the value and potential use of collection collections help to determine both the priorities for preservation action and the appropriate preservation method to use. Um, and the results of this whole preservation planning process is not just to, you know, have fun talking about preservation, which, of course, I think that's very fun, but it's actually, in the end, to come up with a formal, written, long-range preservation plan. A written plan um, not only works to validate the role and importance of preservation, but it also helps to make preservation an equal partner um, in other institutional priorities, which is really vital for that advocating for collections care that, that Lee talked about so much. Um, really vital for securing the necessary resources and funding. And uh, Susan has given you a little bit more information there about um, Sherilyn Ogden preservation planning worksheets. Um, Sherilyn Ogden is sort of like the, the guru goddess of preservation planning, so I definitely recommend looking into that. This book here that I have up on the screen is another really excellent resource, um, so you should definitely check that out too when you are trying to work on, on writing a preservation plan. Um, she divine, defines a preservation plan as a document that uh, defines and charts a course of action to meet an institution's overall preservation needs for its collection provides a framework or context for carrying out established goals and priorities in a logical, efficient, and effective manner. It is a working tool for achieving agreed upon priorities over a set period of time. So it's, uh, it's really, I love that definition of it. Couldn't have said, said it better myself. Sharon says that the book is out of print, so I'm not sure, maybe it'll come back, or maybe there's a library that you may be able to borrow it from. Um, oh, and here Susan knows there's a second edition coming out, so that's pretty exciting. Keep your eyes peeled um, for that. Maybe there's something, um, maybe an, a library you might be able to borrow it from. If you are near Philadelphia, I believe we have a copy, copy here at CCAHA you might be able to borrow. Um, so actually having that tangible written plan is super important in this as well. Um, the needs of the collections are really multifaceted and complex, and they need to be strategically addressed. And sort of the best way to do that is to put it all out there, write it all down, have it all out there. Um, and as we've discussed, the preventative preservation is cost effective, will have the greatest Im impact um, long-term plan on the collections. Uh, having that written document also really helps the staff. Um, it helps sort of direct and guide them ongoing collections care and management of the um, collections, outlining the needs, ongoing projects, necessary staffing and funding. And when I say staff, I don't just mean paid staff. Um, this can be a really helpful um, volunteer management tool as well, um, trying to make sure all of the pieces are sort of working together. Um, so I, I taught a whole series of workshops on preservation planning through New York State earlier this year. and. Um, a lot of the comments that people got back was this is just a really good way to organize staff, volunteers, everybody, so that we're all sort of on topic. 
and writing this down because there are so many sort of moving parts is really important. Okay, so now we all know why this is important and why we want to do it. Um, let's talk about um, you know, a little bit about the components of a plan. We already know kind of what, how we're going to start there. We're going to use the same team that we gathered for our preservation assessment. Um, we're going to have a lot of sort of data. We've assessed a lot of needs. Um, but now we want to talk about what the best way to go through the variety of substances we discussed, um, actually break them down and create them or use them to create a preservation plan. So now, of course, there's many ways to do this. There is no like one size fits all, kind of like those uh, the assessments I talked about before. Um, you should definitely, you know, other assessors are going to have things set out in certain ways. This is the way that I um, like to do a preservation plan. Um, but of course, you should do whatever kind of works best for you. Um, obviously, preservation plans are going to vary greatly from institution to institution, but generally, um, the preservation plan should outline goals, objectives, and strategies for the next three to five years for the collection. Um, the plan should focus on staffing, funding, space, building, environment, security, emergency preparedness, collections development, access, intellectual control, and more detailed topics that relate specifically to collections preservation. This sounds sort of familiar, doesn't it? It kind of sounds a little bit like what's covered in those preservation needs assessments, right? So that is on purpose. Um, the, the plan should also um, outline actions necessary to provide adequate staff and funding, assign responsibility, and set a schedule for implementation. So the sections you see over on the left-hand side of the screen are a bit more in general. They're self-explanatory. So um, you know, I don't want to go over them in too much detail, but in short, you do want to make sure you're setting the institutional uh, background, a description of the collections, a general overview of the preservation needs, um, a list of preservation accomplishments to date. I, I really like including that um, because it, it helps you just sort of keep track of things. And I know staff turnover, and it's kind of hard to know what worked and what didn't. So if you can sort of get in the habit of, of writing things down in these sort of living documents, preservation plans, then you'll always sort of have that record. Um, you do also want to show where this plan fits in to the rest of your organization. Um, so that's important as well to, to show, as you're talking about, it's an equal partner with other areas of the institution. And you do want to make sure in this sort of um, that general area that you are talking about how this is fitting in in that sort of big picture. The items on the right-hand side of the screen, especially what I've started there, are a little bit more complicated, so we're going to do a deeper dive over there. We will talk a bit about the prioritization of tasks soon, because that is really important, and we will have a short homework assignment on that. But for now, I want to focus on the, the big starred section there, preservation goals and objectives. This is really kind of the meat of the plan, um, and the sections below that, the project priorities, project timelines, uh, takes the information you set forth in that bigger preservation goals and objectives and maps it into a timeline. So let's go ahead and break down um, that a little bit more. Um, so if anybody's done any strategic planning or anything like that, this is probably going to look pretty pretty familiar to you. Um, but this, uh, this is the idea of breaking things down into sort of bite-sized chunks. And I've said that a lot in people's comments, too. Think about how you can take this big concern and break it up into little bitty bite-sized chunks so that they're more approachable. The goal is that that big picture thing. It describes where you want to be in the future. It's at the end of the, this five-year plan, this is what we, we want it to look like. Or you could even dream bigger. In the end of 10 years, in, in my biggest dream, this is where we want to be. It's broad, big picture. It's, it's not always measurable. It sometimes is, but it can just be more of an ideal. Um, those, are, those are big and sometimes amorphous things. You want to break those down into objectives, into the, the little steps, explaining how you're going to reach each of these goals. These are often more measurable, and you can often sort of set a target um, goal with that. 
Each of those are then broken down smaller into the strategies, which are those actions or tools used to reach each objective. And those get very specific. So we sort of move up in specificity as we go through this. And I'm going to show you some examples to kind of explain what I mean about this. Um, so since we, we talked about the health thing already with our preventative versus uh, 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 remedial preservation, so we'll just use a non-cultural her heritage example to sort of explain this concept a little bit more. Um, you know, you want to lose weight, so be healthy. That's your big goal in five years from now. I, I want to have lost weight. You could have that be measurable or, or not. You could just want to be more healthy, right? And then how do you break that down? What are the, the steps there? You know, exercise, you'll eat healthy. A little bit more detailed, right? And then you break it down into the even more specific detail, right? Your exercise, you're going to do 30 minutes of cardio a day. You're going to lift weights for 20 minutes a day. Seems crazy to me. This person must not be working full time. But, um, you know, that's the idea behind it there. See how it gets sort of more specific as we break down. And that's the same idea with your preservation plan as well. You're going to be breaking things down. Let's do a cultural heritage example here um, as well. Um, I'm going to start with my big goal, to maintain environmental conditions that meet conservation standards for the long-term preservation of collections in all areas of collections materials. Right? That's sort of big. Um, you know, in five years, it's sort of an ideal. Five years from now, that's what I'm, 10 years from now, that's what I'm hoping we'll be at. Then you'll further outline how you're going to meet the goals. It's a series of objectives. And, you know, I have two here, but you could, you definitely could and should, in a lot of cases, have more than two. But just for the purposes of this example, um, I, I have two. So the objectives are sort of self-contained, um, will form sort of the foundation of the course of action outlined further in the preservation plan. So before I can maintain them, I have to know the environmental conditions. And then I have another one that sets a target. Remember how we talked about that on the previous slide? Um, you can set a target for, I want to have the humidity between this range. So then each of those is broken down even further into more easily accomplished activities or strategies, which again I've done here, lines up with the idea um, where you want to sort of break it down into little tiny bite-sized chunks. So to know the environmental conditions, I need to purchase and install data loggers. I need to also establish an environmental monitoring program so that I will know the environmental conditions. That keeping humidity between that might be that I run a dehumidifier when it when RH hits 60%, right? Which I will know because I've established an environmental monitoring program. Um, so you can kind of see how it breaks down there. So after each after listing each of these activities, you will definitely want to designate responsibility for each activity and establish a timeline for completion. Determining the schedule for completion who will carry out the activity, and who will be responsible for ensuring that is completed on schedule are key to a successful implementation of the preservation plan. So you can't just kind of say these, you know, it's really important to tie them to a specific person. That can be a volunteer. That can be, you know, a, a temporary employee, something like that. It doesn't have to be the, you know, head of collections or collections manager every time, but it is important that it is assigned to somebody. Um, along with that, you will also want to identify resources required to carry out each activity so that those resources can be factored into the institutional budget. And resources um, can include not just money, and I know that comes to, come to mind first, but also staff and time, uh, space, supplies, of course money is part of it, and also if you might need some outside expertise to, to come in with some of it. Um, again, you'll also want to schedule, uh, create a schedule for completion for each activity to be sure that, you know, you're, you're keeping, you're keeping up with everything. And that can be helpful to, to give sort of those deadlines, due dates to staff. Um, make sure that it's realistic. I always recommend sort of over budgeting time. It's easier and better for staff morale if you've come in ahead of a project. Um, and some of that will be related to prioritization, that timeline, those things kind of go hand in hand. So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail soon. But you want to make sure that you're definitely assigning responsibility and assigning a due date. 
So hopefully this is starting to make sense. I wanted to show one more example and then have you guys help me out with one um, just so we can practice a little bit. This is, I love emergencies, as you guys are probably learning, but um, so uh, another one that might, um, might, might ring true for some of us, our big goal, safeguard the collection from emergencies. Um, how can you break that down into objectives? One objective might be have an up-to-date emergency plan. What might be one of the first activities you would do with that? You might form a cross-departmental team to update the current plan or write a new one, depending on your situation, right? Um, another objective, reading up to our, our big goal of safeguarding the collections, is to ensure a, an effective response. So to have an effective response, we might need to have supplies, right? So you're going to purchase and replenish your emergency kit. Um, having an effective response is also important that your staff knows what they're doing. So you want to conduct staff training annually. You can see how it's sort of breaking down, broken down into these little bite-sized chunks. I know a lot of the, the kind of goals can seem really overwhelming, but if we can really think about it like this, it makes it a little bit easier to tackle. So I have a couple here, um, and we'll have to sort of write frantically in the comments there um, about how you might break this down into an objective or a strategy, or objective and strategy. Um, but let's kind of see if we can do one together. You guys can help me out a little bit. So what if our main goal is in five or ten years, right, our collections are housed to conservation and preservation standards. What would be an objective that we could do with that? Oh, I see lots of people typing, so that's great. Um, but thinking about those, those bite-sized chunks, it's a, that's a big, lofty goal. So, so how can we break it down and, and make this more achievable? I see. I still see some typing, so I, I will. I'll let the typing happen for a minute. So I'll just talk this all the time. So remember, you're you're breaking it down into one one big step is the objective, and then those go even smaller into into little littler individual items. So Elizabeth suggests to work collection by collection to get all items in neutral boxes. That's that's a great sort of way to think about it, breaking it down um, by collection. So you might have we're going to start with you know, the, the Elizabeth collection, right, will be the first one we tackle, and then we'll do the Emily collection next, or whatever that sort of thing. That's, that's a good way to go about it. Um, Emily suggests assessing how many preservation boxes are needed. Yep, that might be a little bit uh, later down on, um, well, it could go either way, right? You could have that as an, an objective, and then putting them in the boxes, right, might be your, your, um, your strategy there. Uh, Claire um, H. says assessments of current housing. Yes, I think that's a really good one to do. You can't really know, like, you don't know what you're going to do until you know what you have, right? Um, so that's a great one, assessing it. Uh, Claire T. says identifying priorities identified in the survey. Yes, so you're, if you have a good assessment, and we'll, you know, you can pull a lot of this out of the assessments that you have. Um, so you, you will want to go through and look at what are some of the recommendations from there and, and pull those out, and you can slot them right in off into a lot of these goals, objectives, and strategies. So see what, what has been said in your um, assessments first. Jamie suggests development environmental monitoring and IPM plan. Yeah, that could be sort of a, a, a bigger, bigger topic, too. That might even go more into goals, more into like having that environmental conditions, right? Um, but that could also be a, a, another sub-objective here with this bigger goal. That's what I mean by there's no one, one size fits all, right? You could do this many different ways, so it's going to be important to figure out what is going to work best for you. You could look at this sort of bigger, bigger overall goal and, and think of this purely as housing. You could also think about it a little bit more as the environmental, too. So definitely have to modify according to, to what's going to work for you. Um, I know Sharon is typing, so keep typing over there, Sharon. But I'm going to move on to, oh, there she has developed the plan, breakdowns, objectives, list strategies. Yep, that's exactly the process. Um, so I'm going to do one more example together, um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some other topics here. So here's my other example. Collections are managed with an up-to-date collections management policy. Our big goal, 
10 years from now, we want to make sure we're, we have a collections management policy that is useful, up-to-date, um, appropriate. How can we break this down into some objectives and strategies? All right, so Emily is saying define different parts of the collection and write specific policies for each. Yeah, that might be good. You might also kind of break it down into sections of the collections management policy and just do them sort of, um, you know, one at a time. Um, Claire, Claire H. sort of uh, suggests that too, identify components of the, the policy and, and do it. Um, example, digital versus print. Yes, that's, that's great. So those are both excellent. Um, I sort of missed doing these polls er earlier, but um, let's go ahead and um, we'll, we'll do them now just so we can kind of take, uh, you know, get a sense of where everybody's at. I wanted to ask you guys if anybody had a preservation plan already for their institution, um, and also wanted to ask if you had a strategic plan, because they're both pretty related and they have sort of a similar um, similar sort of uh, strategy of this goals, objectives, and, and strategies. So if you've done it, it might be familiar to you already. Lots of you have strategic plans, so that's great. That's a really good, that's a very good first start to this. And I see some of you even have preservation plans, so that's awesome. If you have some experience with, with writing either of these, please let us know in, in the comments, and um, we, we can learn from each other as well. Great. So I'm going to go ahead. We'll, we'll kind of shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk now a little bit about prioritization. Um, you know, we sort of get this, this theory about how we're going to um, kind of go through things um, kind of step by step, breaking down to, to bite-sized chunks. Um, but how do you know when do you do what, right? Uh, you've gathered your team, you have all sorts of data, information, you have a preservation needs assessment, you know your goals, objectives, and strategies, but how do you figure out what is done first? And this is probably, honestly, the hardest part right here, figuring out how to prioritize. Planning requires, you know, a lot of sort of people skills, understanding the organizational dynamics as a whole at the institution, and nowhere is that more evident than in prioritiz prioritization. So you really need to bring sort of all your interpersonal skills to the and big picture thinking to the to the table. You need to listen to what the issues of other departments are and be able to focus on what best serves the needs of the institution as a whole rather than sort of one particular area, one particular collection, one particular department or your area of expertise, right? So in the long run, that will serve your that whatever that particular area is that you're most worried about, that will serve your that area as, as best also. Um, so luckily, if you've had a preservation needs assessment done, hopefully some of this will have been done for you and it might come a little bit easier, especially because you guys have been working through all of this already and have had that sort of outside consultant to help guide you through it a little bit. But there is definitely still some things you need to go back and, and think for yourself and with your institution. So after gathering all of the information we've talked about, you're going to have a ton of goals, recommendations, et cetera, to consider. Some surveys or assessments, as I said before, might take make prioritization suggestions for you, um, depending on the consultant or type of survey. But even still, you will need to consider and evaluate the recommendations given. Some things to think about include you know, what action is going to benefit the largest portion of the collection what collection or collection items are an institutional priority, and what are the institution's most immediate and pressing needs. Which of the recommendations are feasible in the next five years, right, in, in this, this plan, and which are a little bit more long-term and require more planning and investment? What resources you, you will need. Um, in, in the example that I sent in the handout pages, I have a sample of the of a redacted preservation plan that I worked on an institution here in Philadelphia. 
And in that area, I write a lot about the methodology and how I did the, pri the prioritization there. So definitely check that out when you have time. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, what some other ways to think about prioritization might be. Um, even if you have suggestions from a consultant as what might be your, your biggest, most pressing needs, the, that definitely is, is something to consider. But you also want to think about how it fits into your institution. Prioritizing is the process of deciding which actions will have the most significant impact, which are the most important, and which are the most feasible. So it's important to keep in mind that the preservation plan does still have to fit into an institutional context. Um, that's why we wanted to talk about how it fits into that right in the beginning. So in addition to reviewing the information in your surveys and interviews, you will also want to be reviewing other institutional documents. Most importantly, you should closely examine the mission statement, but other documents you might need to consult um, and review during this process include any other sort of long-range plans, master plans or strategic plans, um, collections policies, emergency preparedness plans, um, appraisals, grant proposals, any sort of other things like that. And remember, what works for one institution might not work for you, right? Just because something is a best practice, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is right for you or fits into your institutional context. Um, but the sort of sweet spot, I think, to determining how important a task or recommendation is, is to see where it fits into this Venn diagram. So I really like to consider these sort of uh, criteria when considering prioritizing preservation actions. The first is impact. Um, this is sort of to the extent the action will improve the preservation of an institution's collection. High impact actions will result in a dramatic improvement in the present condition of materials, substantial decrease in the rate of deterioration, substantial increase in the efficiency of current preservation activities, or considerable savings of time, energy, and money. The high impact thing. Um, the second is feasibility. Actions will sort of vary in the amount of time and resources required to implement them. Some are really easy uh, to implement. You know, well, some are more difficult, if not impossible, right? So factors to include here uh, might be staffing levels, expertise, um, financial implications, and the policy and procedural changes. The political feasibility of various actions must also be realistically evaluated here. If you know that, um, you know, something is going to not work because Joe in maintenance is just not going to do it, right? That is something to consider, right? If it's not feasible to implement an action, it may be given a lower priority even if it's a higher impact. Um, the third thing to consider is urgency, right? Actions can be considered urgent if waiting to implement them would cause further problems or would mean bypassing an opportunity. So if there is a a grant available right now it, to solve this problem, it might bump that task up on your priority list because of, of the opportunity. Um, I also think of this as this literally on fire right now. Um, we have to put it out. It doesn't matter what the other things are. Um, so that, that's another thing that you would want to consider. And all other factors kind of equal, the actions requiring immediate implementation would be given the highest priority. I see a, a comment from Claire over there. Um, about getting quotes. I think that these will be available to uh, after the fact. You guys will have access to the recordings, so um, you might be able to to quote me that way by pausing um, or you know sharing this with maybe whoever you're trying to be convinced that we want to do this. Um, uh, Susan, you can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think the recordings will be available for people later. Um, so no matter if you are sort of uh, you know, how, how you're thinking about prioritization, I, I think it's really helpful to kind of uh, come up with some sort of tool, some something to kind of help you um, think about this in sort of a systematic way so that you're not just, uh, you know, deciding in that Venn diagram, this is where it goes. I like to really give the numerical values. It, it's sort of a tough exercise because sometimes it feels like you're splitting hair. What's the difference between a nine and an eight? What's the difference between, you know, a three and a four? But if if you go through this process and you're able to sort of have that that, that numerical number, even if it's kind of forced and, and seems a little bit arbitrary, it gives you something 
to react to and react against, and, and you can always change numbers. So, um, you know, I do encourage you to think of some sort of systematic way to creating prioritization. Um, there's some online tools we, we've talked about, especially that uh, FAIC risk planning and evaluation tool that I shared with you all during the risk assessment um, webinar. That one's a great one to kind of help you um, do your sort of prioritization with. Um, you know, again, the, the outside recommendations from our consultants are really helpful. But ag again, you might want to go and, and make your own tool to help you sort of standardize the approach, um, even if you are doing something that sort of spits out priorities for you or, or working with a consultant. It's always good to review for yourself. And this way, all the constituents at your institution can be satisfied or they'll at least understand the logic behind you um, or your committee, I actually think you should do this in a committee, um, decisions to prioritize different activities. You know, different areas might think that there are different priorities, so it's really nice to be able to show them we considered all of those factors and, and this is why we are doing things in this order. So once you've developed a sort of pre uh, prioritization criteria or tool, there's a number of ways you can examine recommendations. You can either sort of rank, rate or rank them. Um, this one is just the informal rating system. I, as I said before, I'd always suggest working in a committee for this, uh, really any sort of uh, prioritization project, that team that you assembled, this is sort of a whole team activity. You can kind of see how people are rating various things so you're not sort of working by yourself and, and making decisions in a vacuum, right? This is just a really simple simple DIY prioritization tool that I just made up sort of on the fly. Um, you can just take the list of proposed tasks. That might be the recommendations. These are probably going to be more like those strategies, right, the, the very end. These are the really sort of um, specific actions. Um, and you can kind of look at them, give assign them a value, each of the tasks in the areas of consideration, impact, feasibility, and urgency, and find out uh, the average value to determine an overall score. Using that, you can rank your uh, your really your strategies there, low, medium, or high priorities, as I have up on the screen there. Just a couple of examples that are completely made up. Um, Susan, I, I just took the average number on for the, my final number there uh, of the the rest. But you know, you could do it. However, this is pretty arbitrary. Whatever kind of is working for you to to give you sort of a, a number to work with. Um, I took the average um, for this particular example, but you can definitely, I encourage you to make up a tool that works for you. Um, so once your committee kind of comes up with the criteria for each of these, uh, it'll help you to sort of drive the decisions. And again, there's no one-size-fits-all approach, um, so feel free to, to make up your own tools. I did also want to show you those same examples that, that I just showed on the other side. This is the FAIC, um, the risk evaluation and the planning in, um, planning tool that they have on their website using that methodology. So the way they found that was they looked at sort of um, the, the risk. They identified each risk, um, and then they identified a mitigation solution, and they multiplied the, the risk, as we talked about in, in that last webinar. The risk is the potential for the risk to actually occur and the impact that it's going to have on collections that gives you sort of that overall score. Your mitigation strategy incorporates sort of the feasibility um, of, of doing the mitigation strategy and the impact it will have. And I really like this one because you can sort of put things next to, next to each other to kind of see where your, your money is, is best, best spent. Um, you know, the, the bottom one there, lots of light exposure. It's a, you know, sort of middling risk, but it's a pretty easy for just a light meter mitigation solution, so you might do it to, to check it off your list. That HVAC leak is a pretty high risk, um, and but the repair, as you can see, it's not super feasible, but the impact would be really high, so it sort of has a middling, um, middling thing there and might be worth spending the time and money to do. Um, the processing, the backlog, hiring collection staff, that one is, is a little bit trickier and might not be a highest priority thing to, to do given your current situation. So. Um, you know, just some different ways to kind of think about things. And as I said before, no one size fits all. Um, there's also, I've seen people use this sort of matrix approach before. Um, they just sort of plot things into here. 
Um, again, this is all pretty subjective. You don't want to do it by yourself. You want to be doing it in a committee. You can kind of go through each recommendation, place them on the chart, sort of debate it out with your committee. It's a little less numerically focused, but might work better for some institutions out there. So just wanted to give you a couple of different ways to prioritize, but of course encourage you to make up your own um, systems as well. And this will actually be your homework um, when we come to it. I'll go over it a little bit more, but remember some of these tools and hopefully you have some ideas for some of what tools might work for you at your institutions um, because you will be prioritizing a little bit with um, some of your own institutional needs for your homework assignment. Um, but I did want to kind of go through a sample, and you do have the sample uh, preservation plan and also a template for writing a preservation plan in the downloads. Um, so please make sure to, to check those out. But I did want to kind of show you what a completed section might look like. So um, this is from that sample uh, that I told you about here in Philadelphia. Here we see their, their big goal, what they're hoping to be like in five years. In this case, the, the big goal is to, to be more prepared. Noah like a, a disaster, so um, they want to be more prepared. It's broken down into objectives, and we see one of those objectives here. In this case, it's to have a plan. Then each of those objectives are broken down into smaller strategies. Um, for each strategy, it's important that we are um, being very clear in what you're hoping to achieve also crucial to, crucial to figuring out what resources are needed. Um, there should always be someone assigned the strategy, and they should be given a timeline for completion, which you, you see there. This is so important, so you don't feel like things are just sort of never ending, right? You want to make sure that you have that. And you can kind of see they, they did this with an impact feasibility for there, so just sort of sort of an example of how that might break down. And then, of course, for each goal, you might, you're going to have more than, than one objective. So I did want to show a couple other objectives here as well. Um, and uh, I have not really re reflected here, but you might have uh, more than one uh, strategy as, as well, too. Or excuse me, there are more strategies. I, I put the two strategies up here, too. But there might be more objectives, excuse me, um, that relate to the larger you know, goal of having this emergency plan up to date. So that's what it might sort of look like. And I do hope you go look at the, the downloads to kind of get a better sense of that, um, what it might look like uh, in sort of all laid out. It's sort of hard to show, show the paper documents in a PowerPoint situation, but um, looking at the paper documents will, will help there. Um, and I did want to talk about the ranking and rating and prioritization is so important because eventually you're going to have a lot of these individual strategies, and you can kind of line them all up. Um, here to see where you should be sort of spending your time and money and what the high priority projects might be that you've identified. Um, remember, it's all in the download, so you can really look at this a little bit closer. But the thing here that I'm showing is we're lining up the tasks based on their priority. Um, and then you can also sort of, you could also line it up based on the, the timeline for completion. Things really start falling together this way. You can line things up again. This one is we're showing it by priority. So we're showing sort of those high, the ones that got that high feasibility impact rating. Um, those ones are ones that we're going to probably want to tackle first. We might change our timeline a little bit if, based on based on that. Um, and you also are going to be able to see who is assigned to it. Like, for example, it looks like that paintings conservator is assigned to a lot of these projects. So we might want to consider you know, are they actually able to do all of this? What are some things we can assign to other people? When we have it all laid out like this, it's a lot easier to kind of see it all together, puzzle your way through it, figure out how you might be able to shift around tasks so that things can still be completed. Um, so it's a good, good tool to use, a good um, management tool for staff and volunteers as well. Great. So. Um, I see Elizabeth is writing a question. I'm going to talk just briefly about your homework assignment here, um, just to go over it real quick. So again, I really appreciated reading a little bit about your institution based on your sort of self-assessments. And I didn't go into them in, in a ton of detail, but I did read through them, and I picked out the things that I um, thought might be some of your biggest priorities to kind of, kind of guide you a little bit. But for your homework, I want you to 
you know, you can consider the things I said, but on, as you would do in an assessment, right, you're just, you're taking me, the outside consultant, as one bit of information, but you have to internally decide what your biggest priorities are going to be. So, um, based on kind of your reflection, I want you to think about what the three biggest priorities might be for your institution, um, and then tell us the order, um, you know, are they high, medium, or low priorities for your institution, and then give us a little bit of the justification of each of those. Um, you can upload that in sort of one Word document in the, in the platform back there, and um, again, that's going to be due next Friday for the Credly badge. So um, hopefully that all makes sense. Please let me know if you have any questions about it. I will actually be out of out of the country next week, so Susan will be your main point of contact in a lot of those. Um, and that brings us to the end. I did want to spend some time to see if you had any final questions um, and any wrap up, but it's been a pleasure working with you all and learning a little bit more about your institutions and hopefully you have been inspired to get an assessment and use it as a tool for fundraising and for writing your eventual preservation plan um, at your institution. And if you are coming to the ASLH annual conference, which will be held in Philadelphia um, just at the end of this month, Susan and I are actually presenting um, there about overcoming uh, barriers to preservation. And I'm also doing another session with a local institution here um, in Philadelphia about um, the same topic, making the most of your assessment, uh, and, and a little bit more about how one institution and I have gone through this whole process together over the course of several years. So um, a little bit more follow-up if you are around. Oh, and okay. Sharon is saying she is she's not there, but she signed up for the online conference. And I do have to say I am presenting my uh, session on this topic on the online conference. You can catch me there as well. Right. Yeah. So um, I also wanted to add that um, sometimes it's really helpful in an area that's not a public area to make a big list and use those huge Post-it uh, sheets that like people use in meetings and put mm -hmm. up the stuff you need to do. And then you can cross it off. And crossing it off really helps people feel Super like they're satisfying. accomplishing something. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. At Christmas time, I got a note from one of the museums I used to work with that said, Susan, we've finished everything on your list. Are you ever going to come and see us again? <laughs> <laughs> we yes, there's always more to do. Next. Yes, well, that's, that's right. You know, that's why it's important you can get another preservation needs assessment done, you, as we talked about in the way beginning. Probably every 10 years is, is good for that. And then you um, get to re start this whole process again. So you will have that list. Um, Elizabeth yeah. and Emily are having a question about I have a file. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the details there. but I'm paying attention to your assignments. So don't worry if you got something on week one. I, I will take care of it. And um, thank you, Mike. This is very important, the course evaluation. We really do look at those. They're very important to us. Uh, they help us determine future things and let us know what's good, what's bad, where you're from, that kind of stuff. So please take a minute and fill this out. And I'll also post the link in the, evalu in the uh, uh, handout. And Let's see, if you have any any problems, you should contact me at this address. Um, because if you if you just hit reply in the education thing, it goes to two people before it gets to me. So if you need to ask a question, ask me directly. Um, and I think. I think that's it, unless any of you have any questions. I guess not. Thank you so much, Samantha. This was really good. And um, Yeah, hopefully it's, it's useful. I think the assessments are really sort of an underutilized tool out there, so I'm hoping that this will, will help people yeah. feel inspired to, to yeah, get an assessment and actually use it. So Yeah, and um, we will. Uh, I'll see you in Philadelphia, I hope. Yeah. Uh, whoever's there, you should 
definitely stop us both and say hello. We're always happy to see, to meet the disembodied voices that we work with. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Mike. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you all. And uh, uh, pay attention to the collecting to collections where um, collections care website for future stuff. We have a course on housekeeping coming up in the fall and one on lighting. There's the one on fire. There's archival processing. I can't think of the rest, but you know, pay attention to that and, and we'll we'll see you in the future. Thank you.